Padwans of Code, it's Prof G. Are you ready to show that you are a Jedi of JSON? Well, this lesson is an actual in-class midterm that my students completed as part of their zero to full stack semester of Swift UI. It covers API calls, JSON parsing, loading page JSON when needed while scrolling, recursively loading all JSON pages when the load all button is clicked, loading images from the web using async image, and much more. We'll also include a surprise and delight magic 8-ball-like feature that dispenses advice from our favorite green sage when the Grogu button is pressed. Trust in the Force. Good will follow. Uncertain the answer is. Later, you may ask again. No, I sense the answer is. Do or do not. There is no try. Yes. In the Force I feel this. Impossible to see. The future is... You can either pause the video as I show each question and try to solve the challenges on your own, or watch straight through and code along to complete the app as a tutorial. Although, it is assumed that you've already gone through the Semester of Swift UI course through the catch -em all Pokemon app lessons. You'll need those to understand the concepts used. I won't be teaching these a second time since I assume you've already completed the earlier lessons and understand the basics. But with that said, let's get our Grogu on and defend the Republic with our Star Wars-inspired Swifty skills. So at the university where I teach, Boston College, we celebrate Star Wars Day every May the 4th. May the 4th be with you. We typically have Star Wars crafts in our makerspace. Vader, Chewie, and Stormtroopers can be seen running around campus. There are Star Wars treats, including Bantha Milk. A good time is had by all. So the premise is that Disney has hired you to create a similar app so that other universities can run their own Star Wars Day events. And your first app is the Star Wars Species app using an API call to the swappy.dev site. Swappy meaning Star Wars API. These are some images of what the app will look like if completed properly. You'll use a progress view. When making the API call and parsing JSON, the progress view will spin, otherwise it will hide. The API uses page JSON, so you'll load new pages of JSON as you scroll. You'll see the status area below reflect how many species have been downloaded. The load all button will recursively load all available pages. This API only has 37 Star Wars species. I'm not responsible for the API, but I think it is a great educational tool. And when you click one of the species in the list, you'll see just some of the information that's available, as well as an image of that species that you'll load from the web using async image. The first questions are numbered right here. We'll create a new Swift UI project called Species. We'll download images from this URL, so I'll highlight and copy it. And we'll do what's needed to add an undistorted launch screen using the file named Launch Screen. And we'll use the file named Grogu as the app's icon. Then we'll rename the content view as Species List View. So let's head to the web. We'll paste in the URL that I just copied, then right click, select download, and download these files. Then let's launch Xcode. We'll create a new project. This is an app which is a Swift UI project, and we'll name this Species and Create. Then in the Project Navigator, I'm going to open the Asset Catalog. I'm going to return to the Finder, find the files that I downloaded. I'm going to click and highlight all of the files except for grogu.png and drag them into the Asset Catalog. Then I'm going to click on the app icon, and I'm going to find that grogu.png file, and I'll drag that right into the 1024 by 1024 square, and that'll be my app icon. Now to set up our launch screen, we'll click back on the project icon at the top of the project navigator, click on info, find and click the little triangle to the left of launch screen, then I'll click on the small plus icon down here and select image name for the new launch screen. That image name is simply launch screen, all lowercase, all one word. Then by image name, I'm going to click plus again. I'm going to select image respects safe area insets, and over on the right-hand side, I'll select yes. Then I'll select a scheme to build and run on and click on the play button. Again, my students have seen all of these steps before in the earlier learning videos. I'm deliberately going fast in here and not explaining things in the way that I normally do in tutorials because this isn't a tutorial. So if this is all new to you, you can go back and check out one of the earlier lessons, but we can see... Our app is loading with a launch screen. There's nothing in the app yet, but if we click on the home button in the simulator, we see we've got this cool Grogu icon to launch the app. Nice. Back in Xcode, I'll stop the simulator. Let's click on content view, and I've asked you to rename content view, so double click to select that. Right click, select refactor, rename, and we'll name this as species list view. 
Now, as I'm recording this, there's a bug in Xcode that says it cannot load preview for this file. There's no problem with what we just did. This is a bug in Xcode. But if I open the project navigator, click another file, and then click back on species list view, that error goes away. Now we'll adjust my screen and we can head back and take a look at more questions on the midterm. So in the species list view, we want to create a list that displays the various species names. And to test this before we access the API, we're going to create an array of string values named species array and add a bunch of strings with species names. Now the contents doesn't matter because we are going to replace this with an API call, but I'm using these values here. So you can highlight and copy them if you'd like. The list style should be plain. The elements of the list should use the title font. The list should have a navigation title above it with the name species, and there shouldn't be any padding in the list. And after completing this stage of your midterm, the app should look like the image here. So let's code this up. So in our species list view, we'll create a state variable with at state private var species array. We'll set this equal to square brackets and in between, I'm gonna paste in the names of the species I just copied. Now, since we want a navigation title, we're gonna need a navigation stack. So I'm just gonna highlight this V stack here and change it to navigation stack. Then I'm gonna highlight and delete the image and the text inside of this, and I'm gonna replace it with a list. Now there are lots of options that we can use to create or initialize a list. I'm gonna select one of the options that has a data ID and row content passed in. Now you could create just a plain list with content and use a for each inside, but we don't need to do that. The for each is really typically something that we use when we wanna take advantage of on delete or on move. But since this is a read only app that's getting data from an API call and we're not modifying it, we technically don't need the for each inside of here. So we're just gonna choose a list with data ID and row content. The data is going to be species array, the variable we just created above. And for now, the ID is going to be backslash dot self, but we'll change that after we create a model. Then I'll press return to get the trailing closure format for row content. And the value that I'm going to pass in will be named species. And each element of the list will have a text view inside and between parens we'll pass in species. Now this list is not in the style we want. So below the list, we'll say dot list style and we'll pass in dot plane. We also want to add a dot navigation title and pass in the string species. We also want to add a font modifier passing in dot title. And this is almost correct, but we also want to get rid of the dot padding modifier below the navigation stack. So everything is pretty much flush left. Looking good. Let's move on to the next question. So we're going to be building an MVVM app. So we've got to create a new model file. We're going to call that species. This model should be identifiable and should include everything else necessary to use this to access JSON like the data that we see at this URL. Now these values down here are spelled exactly like the keys and the key value pairs of the JSON. So we want to use these as the names of the properties in our new model. They should all be strings. So I've highlighted these and I'm going to copy them just to make it easier to set up my model. And if you happen to head over to the web page that shows this API using the URL that I gave you on the prior page, you can see that we have a bunch of key value pairs in this results array that we have here that have various names that we want to add to our model. So let's head back over to Xcode and create that model file. I'm going to right click on my species app file. I'm going to select new file and this is a Swift file, not a Swift UI view. We're going to call this species with a capital S. Remember, when we create new structs like we do with a model here, we're in effect creating new types. The convention in Swift is to capitalize your type, so that's why we call it capital S species. And inside this file, we'll say struct capital S species colon, and we want this to be identifiable, comma, and also codable. Very important you remember to make this codable because you've got to decode JSON, and in order to do that, we need to have our structs as codable structs. Then open and close curlies. Since we're identifiable and we're building a read-only app that downloads JSON from the net. We're not going to change any of that data. We're going to create our ID variable, which is necessary for an identifiable struct as a let constant. So we'll say let ID equals capital UUID open and close parens dot UUID string. Then down below, I'll say var name equals, I'll initialize all these. So I'll initialize this as an empty string. And you know what? I forgot. I'm going to paste in all of those variable names, the property names that I copied from the test itself. And then I'll modify all all of these values so that they start with the var keyword and they're all going to be initialized to empty strings. They're all strings, even average height and lifespan, which look like they should be numbers. Those come back as strings as well. Now, because we're not getting the ID property from the JSON, but we're getting everything else from the JSON, we want to set up a coding keys enum that has all of these properties except for ID. So we'll say enum capital C coding, capital K keys, one word, colon, then capital C coding, capital K key, singular, one word, open and close curlies. We'll say case, 
I'll paste in all of those names that I'd copied earlier, and we'll just remove the dashes and put commas after each one of these property names. So with this, the model is going to be done, and now it's time to create a view model, and that's what the next question asks. We're going to create a view model called species view model and do everything necessary so that it can be used as a view model for this app. There should be a property visible throughout the app that when changed should trigger SwiftUI views using this value to redraw. So that's a big hint that we should create a published value wrapped with the at published property wrapper. This value should be named species array, which should initially be set to an empty array of species structs. Now I also specifically ask you to create a struct called returned that will allow you to decode the following JSON elements from the data returned by the API, a string named next, which contains the URL of the next page containing JSON that we're going to load. Note this value will be null when the last page is received. So even though this looks like a string value, we want to create it as an optional string because it might return null, which is interpreted by Swift as nil. If we initialize this value as a string and not an optional string, we would get an error when we hit that last page. This is the same technique we learned about in the Catch em All Pokemon app. And also part of that return struct should be a value named results, which is an array of species. That's the model that we just created. We also want to include a variable named URL string, which has the value set to this URL. So I'll highlight this URL to copy it so that I can paste it into my code. And then we'll head back to Xcode. I'm going to right click on species. I'm going to create a new file. It's going to be a Swift file and I'm going to call this species view model. Now, when we say everything necessary to use this view model to access JSON, well, my students know that they should start with at main actor at the top of a JSON accessing view model. We'll set this up as a class. We'll call this species view model in upper camel case colon. This is always an observable object. Again, my students should know that from the earlier lesson. So we're going through this really fast. This is not a tutorial. The earlier lessons were tutorials. This is just confirming what the solution should be. Open and close curlies. Inside, I gave you the hint that we should create a published property. So that's at published. And this is going to be a variable. We're going to call this species array as requested. Colon. This is of type an array of species structs. So we'll say square brackets with capital S species inside. And we'll set this equal to an empty array, which is just open and close square brackets. Then on the next line, we're going to create a variable var URL string equals. And I'm going to paste in the string that I just copied from the test. This does not need to be a published property because when this changes, it should not indicate that we need to update our Swift UI user interface. So we can just create it as a straight up variable. No need for it to be published. Now, next up, we're going to create that return struct I asked you for. So we'll say struct capital R returned colon. And very important, this has got to be codable because we're using it to decode JSON. Open and close curlies. Then inside we'll create properties var. We'll call this first one next colon. And this is going to be string question mark. It's optional because we'll return null on the last page. And below this, we'll also create a property called results colon and array squared brackets of the species struct that we just created. And it's really important that lowercase next and lowercase results are properties that contain the exact same name as keys in the key value pair that we see in JSON. And that is exactly what we have. If these names didn't match up with the same spelling in the same case, we wouldn't be able to parse our JSON. We'd get a JSON decoding error. Now we're ready to add a get data function, and that's what we ask for in question seven. You should add a working get data function to the species view model. And at this point, the get data function should do what's necessary to use the URL string value that you added above to call URL session and retrieve data. You should parse the retrieve JSON data so that it's passed to the variable named returned, which we created above with the appropriate array passed into the published property species array. Then create an instance of species view model named species VM in the appropriate location in your app. Use species VM to call your get data function when the species list view first appears and modify the code in species list view so that it now uses the species array property of species VM and a properly functioning get data function should show the first 10 names in the first page of JSON data that's retrieved by the URL string. And it should look like this. We can see the last species in this list is named Sulistan. And if we take a look at the last element in this JSON array that's returned on the first page, it's also Sulistan. So let's code up the solution.
We'll define the function with func get data open and close paren, so pass no values in. We have to use the async keyword after this, since this is going to be an asynchronous function. Whenever we call this, we need to make sure that we do it with await. Open and close curlies. Then below this, I always recommend printing out the URL that you're about to call for the API. So I'm going to say print in between double quotes. We are accessing the URL string interp URL string. And I always put a web emoji out front so that it's easy to find in the console. Then we need to convert that URL string to a URL type, which is what SwiftUI needs in order to be able to access the URL and make the appropriate API call using the URL session function. So down here we're going to say guard let URL equals capital URL, since we're going to be initializing a new URL, and we're going to use the option with string passing in URL string. We'll say else open and close curlies. We have to return, and above this we'll also print out an error. Print angry emoji error colon could not convert string interp url string to a url then down below we're going to call url string and since this is going to use try because it throws errors we're going to put this inside of a do catch clause so do open and close curlies catch open and close curlies now we'll also return these values into a constant so we'll say let and this returns two values data and a url response we only care about the data so in between parentheses we'll call our data lowercase data comma and since we don't care about the url response we'll put an underscore in here then we'll set this equal to try, and also URL session is an asynchronous function, so we also need to follow this with await. Then we finally get to URL session, which is capital URL S, Eschen, URL session, spelled like this, dot shared dot data, and we want to select the option from, which passes in a URL, and again, you can see in code completion that this is an async function, that's why we need await, and it throws an error, which is why we need try, and we put that within a do catch clause. You also see after the arrow that we have a tuple, or we have the two parentheses, meaning it's going to return, in this case, two values. Tuples can have more than one value. The first type is a data, and we're calling this data, and the second type is URL response, and again, we got an underline there. So we'll select this, and for the from value, we're going to put in URL, which is the URL we created in the guard statement above. And now let's put an error in the catch clause. I'm just going to copy this error that I have from up in the guard statement and paste it in catch, and I'll change it so that it says error could not get data from URL string, string interp URL string. Then below the let statement, if this try clause works out, if URL session returns a value that's not an error, there are a few ways to do this, but we're gonna do this with another do catch clause. So do open and close curlies, catch open and close curlies, and that's because we're about to decode the JSON or parse our JSON, and that could also throw an error. So we're gonna parse this into a constant that we call return. So we'll say let lowercase returned equals try, JSON decoder open and close paren, so that's gonna create a JSON decoder for us, decode decode takes two parameters one which is the type of value that we're decoding json into and the from value is the data that we're decoding from so select this and at this point the data value that we have is the json that's returned from the page but what we'll put in here for the type is capital r returned dot self Remember, returned is this struct that we created up here. It absolutely has to be codable, and it is. We see that it also has an array of species structs that's part of it. That's what this results property is, and if we take a look at our species struct, we can see that that's codable as well. So everything that we decode and everything that's nested inside of it all have to be codable. If you don't do that, you're going to get an error. So again, we're decoding from this data constant that we created above, and in the catch area here, I'm just going to copy the error that I have down below, paste it above, and this is going to be a JSON error. Often Sometimes this is where students run into problems because what they're trying to pour JSON into doesn't match the structure of the JSON that we see in the web page. So that's why I like to flag this specifically as a JSON error. And if this error occurs, we're also going to print out could not convert data into JSON. And in the string interp here, I'm going to say error.localized description. So if you ever hit this line, that means that the structure that you've created to decode the JSON into does not match the JSON. Now, if this works, what we could do down here is simply print returned colon string interp return to print out the results. That's often a good thing to do. After printing, you could just take a look at what prints out in the console to make sure things are working. But I'm pretty comfortable that I'm going to get back what I want to use. So I'm going to go ahead and first set up a line in here to update my URL string. So URL string is the first page of JSON. I'm going to set URL string equal to returned.next. Now remember, returned.next is an optional value. We've got a question mark after it because in the last page of JSON, it could return null. And via JSON, when converted into Swift, that's going to be nil. 
So if return.next is nil, we'll use nil coalescing, which is two question marks. And on the right side of the two question marks, we'll put in an empty string, which just means if return.next comes back as no, and it is in fact nil, we'll put an empty string value into URL string. Also below this, we want to take our species array, which is our published property, and set this equal to returned.results. And since species array is published, once that changes, it's going to trigger SwiftUI to redraw our user interface. Nice. Now we've set up our get data function, but we've got to call that get data function. And we're going to do that from species list view. We're going to replace the state variable that we set up simply to make sure that we could create a list in our navigation stack here. So I'm going to delete this state variable here, and I'm going to replace that with state object. We need to create an instance of or an object from our species view model class. So that's going to be a state object. We do that with the first First instance we create from observable object. Remember our view models are always set to colon observable object when we define them. And we'll follow state object with var. We'll call this species VM lower camel case and set it equal to upper camel case species view model open and close parens. Now when we did to do style apps, we were passing data around to different pages where they could be updated on different pages. But since this is a read only app, we can put our state object right here and we're not using environment objects because we're not passing editable versions of this object around from page to page. We're simply passing data from one page to another page to be viewed. So while it's possible to use the environment object techniques that we showed earlier, where we create a state object in the app file, that's what we did in our to-do list and in the apps that we did in class, places I've been, or the student list. Here, since we're not changing the data itself, it's only read-only data, so we don't pass change to data back and forth throughout the app, we can just use the state object right here. Now we get an error down in our list view where we create the individual text views in this list. That's because we no longer have species array as a property of this struct. It's now species VM dot species array. So we'll add the species VM out front. We also don't need the ID property anymore because remember species array is made up of species structs and those are identifiable. So I can delete the ID value here and also make sure you get rid of the comma. We'll still call this species when we pass in or we iterate through the species vm dot species array, but inside of text, we'll refer to this as species dot name. Nothing is showing up in the live preview yet because we haven't called our get data function yet. I'm going to fix the indentation with command A control I. There, my curlies are now in the right spot. And remember, we want to get data as soon as this view appears. So there are a few ways we could do this. Under the navigation stack, we could say dot on appear, open and close curlies, and then capital T task, open and close curlies. But Swift UI also has a dat task modifier, which does both of these curlies in one modifier. So for efficiency, we'll use dot task, open and close curlies. And since we're calling an async function, that's what get data is. Remember, we defined it with async in our function definition line. We need to include the await keyword. If we forgot it, Swift UI would remind us and offer to fix that. And after await, we'll say species VM dot get data, open and close parens. And look at that. Our first 10 species are downloaded as expected. Question complete. Nice. Next, we want to create a detail view to show the detail of a species downloaded. It should look like the one that we'll show below, and it should display all elements aligned to the left. The species name at the top is in large title bold font, a gray rectangle two points high, stretches across the entirety of the available space as a sort of underline. There is standard padding between all of the elements in the view. All elements that are on a line together should be aligned to the top as well. For example, we see that the eye colors and the two lines for eye color values have aligned to the top in the example below. And a proper detail view should look like this one. You can use preview using the same values for grading consistency and testing. So let's code this up. In the project navigator, I'm going to right click on my species list view. I'll select new file. Remember, this is going to be a Swift UI view. And we'll call this detail view. Now this is going to show detail on a species, so we need to pass over species. So in here we want to display all of the data on the species, that's going to be part of a species struct, and since we don't need to modify this and we're going to be passing the species over via a navigation link that we're eventually going to add in the species list view, we can declare this as a constant species colon as type species, and we don't need to initialize this. We're going to pass in the initialization from the species list view. This is the same technique that we used in our Game of Thrones app. There's no problem if you created this as a variable in here, but it doesn't need to be. 
Again, it shouldn't be initialized because we're going to pass the value in from species list view. Now, because we've got an uninitialized property of this struct, we need to change our preview provider down here. So I'll backspace over the empty parentheses and detail view. And if I start to type parens again, we now see that it wants a species value in here. So we'll press return and we'll initialize this with capital S species. I'll select this option down here to make sure that I'm passing in some placeholder values that I can use that will render in the preview provider that's the live preview over on the right. Remember our pro tip from earlier lessons and in class, hold down the option key and that will automatically select all of the properties to initialize this species. And I'll enter a bunch of strings for these different values. The name will be Swifter, classification will be coder, designation will be sentient, average height. And remember, this is a string. All these values are strings. So the string 175 between double quotes, the average lifespan will be 83. The language will be Swift. Skin colors will be various. Hair colors will be various or none. I'm in the none category except for my chin. Eye colors will be blue, comma green, comma brown, comma black, comma hazel, comma gray, or violet. It really doesn't matter what these values are as long as each one is a string. This is going to give us some values to work with on the right. Then we're going to want to work with a vstack, so I'm going to replace the text view hello world with a vstack, open and close curlies. Inside I'll include a text view, passing in species.name. This should be .font, passing in .large title, and also .bold. We'll put a spacer down below to push this to the top. Now I want the elements of the vStack to be aligned to the left. So I'm gonna include parentheses after the vStack and say alignment colon dot leading, and we don't see this change. And that's because even though the elements inside the vStack are dot leading, the vStack itself is gonna be centered inside the view and it's only gonna take up as much space as it needs. Now we're gonna rectify this situation down below and we add our rectangle. So we'll add just after text, rectangle, open and close parens. And we'll follow this with two frame modifiers. One dot frame setting the height parameter to two, and the next one, the dot frame parameter, has a max width colon of dot infinity. Look at that, it spreads that out across the view. We'll also add a dot foreground color, setting this to dot gray. And to make sure this doesn't touch the sides, I'll add a dot padding parameter below the curly that closes the vStack. Now I want the two items of text to be aligned on the same line, so I'm gonna put them in an H stack. So one element is gonna be bold and the other isn't. If I didn't do that, I would see a misalignment of values. So I'll say H stack, open and close curlies, text passing in the string classification dot bold. And after this, we'll say text passing in species dot classification. And just to show you this issue with aligning things at the top here, I'll do it up front so that we can copy the way that we set up the H stack and save ourselves a little bit of time. I'm gonna change the text down here just temporarily to species.icolors. You see how the default for aligning H stack is to align these items by their middles. So I can put parentheses after the H stack and use the alignment property colon and pass in dot top. And in the event of whatever we pass in as the species property in here is larger and it goes on more than one line, this will align things nicely by the tops, which is what we want. And that's also what we showed on the test. So now that this one H stack is what I want, I'm gonna highlight this copy and I'm gonna paste it down below. I'll change the text here to designation, and this is got to the right of it, species.designation. Oh yeah, and I've also got to change my classification back here to species.classification. I'll paste another copy of this h stack down below, change this to height and species.average height. And next to height, I also want on that same line lifespan. So I'm just gonna copy these two elements here, paste them down below, and change this to lifespan colon. Oh yeah, and for consistency, I wanna have colons after all of my static text in here, so I'll do that. And make sure after lifespan, I'm looking at species.average lifespan. And I wanna put a spacer between the height and the lifespan, just make sure I do that in the right spot. And we can see that pushes those two different portions of the H stack out to the two different ends. This looks good. Now I still have a few more of these H stacks with the two elements inside. So I'm gonna highlight and copy this again and paste it down below. And I think I want four more copies of this. So the first one's gonna be language, colon, species dot language. The next skin color, colon, species dot skin colors. Hair colors, species dot hair colors. And the last is gonna be eye colors, colon, species dot eye colors. Now I also wanna change the font of all of these values here. So what I'm gonna do is go up to the first H stack and I'm gonna hold down the command key and I'm gonna embed this in a group. Then I'll highlight all of these other H stacks, cut them out with command X, paste them inside the group, and down below the closing curly of the group, I'll say dot font, passing in dot title two, and that looks good. And we should see this looks exactly like the image that we showed in the test, and it does. On to the next question. You need to add a navigation link to the species list view so that when you click on a species, that species loads into the detail view. Also, when you set this up, there should not be an additional space at the top of the detail view where the navigation title might be. So let's build this. 
We'll head to the species list view and just under the list inside the list, I'm going to add a navigation link. I'll select the option with destination and label. The destination is going to be detail view. It wants a species. So we're just going to pass in lowercase species, the item that we're iterating through when we iterate through the species array. And one thing to look at is if we head back over to the detail view, we're passing in this value and we're using it as the constant let species appear. It's of type species. We haven't initialized this because it's being passed over from that navigation link we just set up. So cool. And back in our species list view, we'll just move the text over to the label area. Now let's try out the awesomeness. We'll click on Wookie and we see it in the detail. <laughs> Now we also see that we've got this big gap up top and we only see that when we navigate over from the species list view. If we look at the detail view, we don't see that big white space gap up top. We don't see it here because we're not embedded in the same navigation stack that we use when we come over from species list view. But when we come over from species list view, we see that gap because we need to set the navigation bar title mode to inline. Otherwise it assumes a large title mode. Since we don't have any title in here, it just gives us a big large white space. So to eliminate that white space, just below the padding in the detail view, I'm gonna add dot navigation bar. It's titled display mode. In between the parentheses, I'll say dot inline. We're not gonna see any change on detail view, but if we head over to species list view and click on an item. Now we see we don't have that big gap of white space at the top. Things are looking good. Now on to question 10. We want to do everything necessary to add an image to the detail view. Note the following. Images can be accessed from a URL with this format. So I show you a URL. I've got name highlighted and italicized in here and say where name is the URL above just before .jpg where that is changed to the name of the species to be displayed. So for example, humans would be this one here. Note it says human in there just before JPEG. And I'm also going to highlight and copy this URL. So I've got something to work with on the clipboard. Droid would be, and we see this URL, the same thing, but we've got droid just before JPEG. Note that the H in human and the D in droid are also capitalized exactly as the name is listed in detail view. Images should be centered horizontally within the iPhone screen and images should display the system's SF symbol photo as the placeholder and note that the image fits into the available space. Retain the width by height ratios and make sure that they have a corner radius of 15 with a shadow that is also a 15. Also note the image should display with a default animation which fades them in very quickly when loading. An important note, some species have spaces or apostrophes. These don't work well with image URL so you should write a function named return species URL, which creates a value with any spaces in a species name replaced with dashes and removes any apostrophes, single quotes from the value, and it should return the URL containing the resulting value, i.e. the name modified accordingly, meaning spaces replaced with dashes and apostrophes removed so that it can be incorporated into a URL that you will use to find the appropriate image. For example, if the species is Yoda's species, calling return species URL should return and we see the URL down here, but Yoda's species has no apostrophe and it has a dash between the S and the S in Yoda's species. But calling return species URL on human will simply return the URL with the word human in here. At this point, all species images should show when clicked on from the species list view. The first example down below shows the view from the detail view. So we've got the photo as a symbol in there, but the others are what you should see when navigating from the species list view. And just to show you what we get with that URL, if you ever want to test it, we can click on the human URL up here and we see a big image of the humans loaded in our browser. And if I highlight the word human in the URL and replace that with Yoda's species with a capital Y and a dash between the S and the S in Yodas and Species, press return, we see the green sage in here as well. So let's code this up. We'll head over to the detail view and just above the spacer, this is where we're going to use async image. Remember, async image allows us to load an image from over the web. We've got lots of different options in here, but we want to select the one with the URL, the content and the placeholder. Remember, we're going to have our SF symbols photo in there as the placeholder. For the URL, we need to convert a string to the URL. So we're going to highlight the URL initializer in here that passes in the string. For now, between double quotes, I'm just going to paste in a string that I'd copied showing the URL for humans from the test. I'll tab over, press return for trailing closure format. I'm going to refer to the image that I'm working with as lowercase image. Then down here in the code, we'll refer to lowercase image. Again, that's our image view. And below that, we'll say dot resizable, open and close parens, dot scale to fit, open and close parens. We'll also add dot corner radius 15 and dot shadow with a radius of 15. 
and we want to perform an animation. So we'll say dot animation dot default, and that should change whenever our image changes. Then down here for the placeholder, we'll use a capital I image view in here, selecting the option with system name and in between quotes, we'll pass in lowercase photo. We see the photo briefly and our image of humans over on the right. This is looking great. Let's make sure we make that system image photo dot resizable and dot scale to fit. And now let's make sure that we craft an appropriate URL for the species name that we're working with. So I'm gonna highlight and I'm gonna cut out this string up here. And as requested in the exam, we're gonna write a function down here, func, it's gonna be called return species URL, open and close parens, pass nothing in there, but draw an arrow and we're gonna be passing back a string, capital S, open and close curlies. Now we're gonna to need to modify our species name to use in our URL. So I'm gonna create a variable for that with var new name equals species dot name. And if we have any spaces in the name, I wanna replace them with a dash. So I'm gonna say species dot name dot replacing occurrences of with, the of should be a single space character, and the width should be the dash. Then down below this, I also want to get rid of any apostrophes or single quotes if I've got them in the name. So I'm going to say new name equals new name dot replacing occurrences of width. The of is going to be the string single quote and the width is going to be the empty string. Then this function is going to return a string. So I'll say return and I'll paste in the string that I copied above, but then I'm going to highlight the word human in here. And instead I'm going to put in string interp new name. We're not quite working yet, so we're gonna head up to async image and what we're gonna pass into the URL now is gonna be the string we return from the function we just wrote, return species URL. Now we see when the magic happens, we get the photo placeholder in here, but let's head over to our species list view, click on human, we get our photo placeholder and then the human show up. But let's click back and click on droid and ah, we see that the images are not centered. Same thing for Yoda species. So in any of these conditions where the images don't take up the full width of the available view, they're not centered. What we want to do is head back to the detail view. Now all the elements on this view are inside of a VStack and that VStack has an alignment property, which is dot leading, which left justifies everything. So what we're going to do to get around this is we're going to embed async image in its own VStack. Now VStacks by default have a center alignment, but the VStack is only going to take up the available space in the view. So what we want to do is we want to stretch out the width of this VStack, which has a center alignment so that it takes up all the available space. And we'll do that with a frame saying below the VStack closing curly dot frame max with dot infinity. And if we check that out back in the species list view, click on Rodian and look at that. He's centered. Everybody else is centered too. Looking good. Mission accomplished. On to the next question. So we want to create a progress view. We're going to add a progress view to species list view. It should be four times as large as the standard progress view and in the color green. It should also show whenever the app begins to download data and it should no longer show when the data has been retrieved or when any get data related errors occur. We'll check out the nest item down here too, which says add a status message to the bottom toolbar of the species list view, which shows the total number of species that have been downloaded at this point. And since we've only downloaded a page of 10 species at this point in the app, it should look like this with 10 species returned. So let's build this. Back in the species list view, if we start to add a progress view just below our list view, we're going to see that the progress view shows up at the bottom. We'll say dot scale effect and we'll select the scale option in here, adding a four in there. And we'll also set the dot tint to dot green. Now this is turning away down below the list. That's not where we want it. So I'm going to highlight this progress view and cut it out. What I want to do is make sure that this is going to be the top element in a Z stack. So I'm going to command click on top of list and embed this in a Z stack. Remember Z stacks are items on top of each other and the items that appear at the bottom of the Z stack are the ones that show up on top. So after the Z stack closing curly, I'm going to paste in my progress view. We see now it's spinning away in the middle of the screen. That's where we want it, but we want to make sure that we only show this conditionally when we're downloading data with the get data function. So let's head over to our species view model so we can take a look at the get data function. Now to be able to trigger the progress view, we're going to create a new published variable that's going to trigger the redrawing of our Swift UI user interface. So we're going to say app published var, we'll call this is loading and initially set it equal to false. So when is loading is false, we don't want to show the progress view, but down here in get data, as we start to get data, we want to show the progress view. So as the first line in get data, I'm going to say is loading equals true. But then where do we want to turn off is loading, turn off the progress view? Well, any place where we exit this function. So that would be any place where we get an error, like just before the return statement in this guard statement. Also, if we properly get data, which would be inside this second do value, the nested do catch right after species array equals return dot results. And we've got two other areas in here where we catch errors. So I'm going to paste this just before the closing curly in this catch and in this catch. 
So we turn on is loading as soon as we call get data and we turn it off at any point where we exit this function. Now let's head back to our species list view and use that published property we just created. So just before the progress view, we're going to say if species vm dot is loading open and close curlies. And if that's true, we'll just highlight this progress view, cut it out, paste it in between the curlies. And notice when our app runs, we briefly see the progress view swirl. You can click on the play button in live preview. Again, we see the swirl show up very briefly. Looking great. Now let's add that toolbar that's got the status information in it. And we want to do that below the Z stack. So I'm going to code fold and then Z stack. And I'm going to add a dot toolbar, open and close curly below this. Now that it's in the right place, I can unfold my code. And inside the toolbars curlies, I'm going to say toolbar item. I'm going to select the option with the placement and the content in here. My placement is going to be dot status. So that puts that right in the center of the bottom toolbar. Tab over to content, press return. This is just going to be a text view that passes in a string with a string interp inside that says species returned and the string interp value is going to be species vm dot species array dot count. And will you look at that? Now we've got our 10 species returned at the bottom of our view. Looking good. So let's head back to our questions. We're on question number 13, which is page JSON. So my students have done several examples of this, including the catch em all app. In class, we also did a Game of Thrones app. We're going to do everything necessary so that when the user scrolls, the next page of JSON is downloaded and is added to the species array. The loading of the new page of the data should be triggered when the last row of the currently downloaded species array appears. When the user has scrolled enough to download the last page of species data, there should be no more attempts to download data as the user scrolls. Below is an example of how the species list view will change. Note that when the view first shows, you should see the full screen of data and 20 species have been returned. So we see these three examples in here looking good. We see how they change when things are scrolling. 20 species, 30 species, 37 are the total number of species. The last element of the species is pow on. I don't know how you pronounce that, but I'm going to guess that's okay. So let's head back to our species list view and code this up. Now in our lesson, we learned that the way that we can tell that an element of a list has appeared is we can embed the internal navigation link in a lazy V stack, not a V stack, which loads all of the elements at once, but the lazy V stack only loads the element, the rows when they are displayed. So that's why we use a lazy V stack. I'm going to command click on navigation link and select embed in V stack since there's not an embed in lazy V stack, but then I'll just add the word lazy in front of V stack. I'll command a control I to fix my indentation. And so how do we tell when a new navigation link has appeared? Well, just below the lazy V stack, we could add a dot on appear modifier in between curlies. We could add a capital T task with open and close curlies, but we also learned that we can use the dot task modifier. So we'll use that with open and close curlies. Now in here, I'm going to put a to do comment that says check to see if we need to load another page. Now the code we're going to need to update to check to see if we need another page is going to be in our species view model. So let's head over there. And at the bottom of our code, let's create a new function. So just before the close and curly func load, if needed, open, close parens, we're going to pass in a species value colon of type capital S species. And after the close parenthesis, this is going to be async. So we need to put that K word in here. It needs to be async because we are going to be accessing get data in here, which is also async. I see that I didn't type func in properly. We'll fix that in a bit. Now, one thing that's going to be absolutely important, I've seen students make a bunch of these mistakes in the past, and I've done them myself. When we download data, if we're going to add data to existing data, up here we say species array equals returned dot results. We want this to be species array equals species array plus returned dot results. So we want to make sure that we're adding the returned results to our existing species array, not overwriting them with a new page of data. And if you wanted to, you could use the shorthand in here, species array plus equals return dot results. Now, how do we know if we need to load another page of data? Well, as the first function in here, what we're going to do is we're going to get the last element of the species array. And we're going to see if the species we pass in is the last element in the species array. If it is, then we must have scrolled to the last element. So we should call get data again to load another page of JSON. So we'll use a guard let statement for this. We'll say guard let last species is what we'll call it. We'll set that equal to species array dot last. Now, the reason I use a guard let statement in this is it's possible that species array dot last will return a nil if there is no last element. That would be if our species array had no elements inside of it. That should never be the case for our code, but 
Since this returns a nil, we need to deal with the possibility of a nil, so that's why we're using guard let in here. We'll follow this with else and open and close curlies with return in here. We'll leave it all on one line. But on the next line, we want to check to see if the last species dot ID equals equals is the same as the ID of the species that we passed in. That would mean that we've scrolled to the last element of the species array, and we need another page of JSON, so we should call get data. Now, if this is true, in between curlies, we want to call await get data, open and close parens, and again, Again, we have to use await in here because get data is an async function. But there's one other condition that we want to deal with. We only want to make sure that we call get data if the last element in the species list has the same ID as the ID of the species that we passed into this function. But also we want to make sure that the URL string is not equal to empty string. So we want to say ampersand ampersand, which is the conditional and in Swift, URL string exclamation point equal for not equal to empty string. When would we have an empty string for URL string? Well, that would occur if we have a null or a nil value in the next value that was returned, which is what happens on the last page of JSON data right here in this nil coalescing value here where we take returned.next and we put it in the URL string. Well, if we get a nil there, that's going to be an empty string. If we get an empty string, we're on the last page of JSON data. We don't want to try to get any more JSON data. So that's why we make sure that we only call this get data if we have something in our URL string. It is not equal to the empty string. So if we head back to the species list view, we don't see anything yet because we haven't checked this function that we just wrote. So inside where we have our to do comment, we'll delete that in this dot task modifier. We'll call await. Remember, it needs to be await in here because that's an async function. The function is species vm dot load next if needed. And we're going to pass in a species, which is species. And look at this over here on the right. We download 20 species right away. And if we scroll, we get 30 species. If we scroll again, we load another page of data. That'll be 37 species. And that's the last one. Notice our last species is power on. This is perfect. In fact, if we head back over and take a look at our JSON and we continue to click on the next URL up here, we load the next page of JSON, the next page of JSON. And the very last page, we see that our next value is null. And we scroll down below and we see the last species is pow on. Everything's looking great. Click on these guys, looking kind of spooky, but loading perfectly. So that's dynamite. Let's head back over and tackle the next question, which is adding the load all button. Add a load all button to the lower left as shown below. The button should be bold and plain style, and when clicked, it should load all the pages of JSON and update the app as expected. And specifically, you should use a recursive function in the view model class to perform this task. And the image below shows what you should see after clicking load all. I've scrolled to the last of the 37 species. So the last species is pow on. So let's build this. In species list view, inside of our toolbar modifier, we're going to add another toolbar item. I'll select the option with placement and content. Remember, if you hold down the option key, placement will become highlighted. The placement will be dot bottom bar. And I'll press return on content to get the trail enclosure format. In between the curlies, I'll add a button with title and action. The button is going to be load all. I'll tab over and press return on action. And I'll put in a to-do comment here that says call load all. So we've got to write that load all function, and we're going to do that in our view model. So head over to the species view model, scroll to the end. And the recursive load all function is really easy to write. So just before the closing curly, I'll say func load all, open and close parens, open and close curlies. I deliberately kept async off here so you can see the error that shows up. Then below, we're going to make sure that we have a valid URL. So we're going to say guard URL string not equal to, that's exclamation point equal, empty string else return. And we do that because we're done if the URL string equals empty string. That means no more pages. That's what we do up here in our nil coalescing after we get the data. Then down below, we'll call get data, and get data is an async function. So we're getting an error in here. If we let Xcode fix this, it's going to add async after load all on the function definition line. That's what we want. And we need to do this because we're about to call get data, which is also an async function. So any calls to async functions need to happen within functions that are also async. Otherwise, you've got to use task. But that means that we need to put await in front of get data, so we'll let Xcode fix that too. 
Now, after we get data, we're going to call the load all function again. So below we put await load all open and close parens. That's the recursive call. A recursive function is a function that calls itself until it's completed. And with load all calling load all over and over, you got recursion. So it's going to call this function over and over again, continuing to load page after page until the point where we have URL string equals empty string. Now let's head back to our species list view and we can change our to do comment so that it reads species vm dot load all open and close parens but this is not everything we need because we are calling a function that is async. Now we're not inside a function here so we don't add a sync around our function definition. There is no function definition but we simply use a task clause here. So we'll say capital T task open and close parens and inside we'll make sure that we call await species vm dot load all open and close parens. Now let's click load all and hey, hey look at that we see that we've got 37 species downloaded and if we scroll to the end we can see pow on is indeed the last species loaded. Nice. We can click on that guy that spooky guy loads looking good. If you click again we're not not loading multiple pages here. We're done loading. Everything's working fine. And now let's tackle the last two questions on the exam. So as you know from your online lesson, Steve Jobs used to regularly say that Apple technology should surprise and delight the user. So you'll add a little bit of Apple style magic to your app by including a Yoda button in the lower right hand corner that will produce spoken advice similar to a magic eight ball. And you'll build it like this. You'll add a button to the lower right of the bottom toolbar. You will display an image peak. That's an image that you downloaded and it should have been added to the asset catalog earlier on in the exam. And this image is of a peaking Grogu. You want to size it so that it's not distorted and that it displays in a frame that's only 25 points high. Yes, the button is Grogu and not Yoda, but he's cuter. And when the button is played, play a random sound from the sounds named 0 through 8 in the Yoda sounds folder that you should have added to your assets catalog. Also very important, the same sound should not be repeated twice in a row. Also, set the accent color to green, so in honor of Yoda, Grogu, and many other species, change the app's accent color, very important, it says change the app's accent color, so you should have known to do that within the asset catalog, to system green. Now I do advise that at the time of recording, there's a bug in Xcode where you might not see any changes to the accent color in the live preview, but if you build and run in the simulator, you should see the change and then it should also show up in live preview next time you refresh that. So if it's working properly, you should see load all in the back button as you see below and the load all button should work when you press the Grogu button and it should dispense Yoda style advice. So let's code this. So to add the button in the lower right, we head over to the toolbar modifier in our species list view and just before the closing curly and dot toolbar we're going to add another toolbar item hold down option and select the option with placement and content the placement here is also going to be bottom bar but it will move the button over to the far right then tab over and press return to get the trail enclosure format and we're going to add a button here and select the option with action and label press return for the trail enclosure format our label is just going to be image and in between quotes peak p-e-e-k lowercase and it's massive but we know what to do we'll just say dot resizable open and close parens dot scale to fit open and close parens and i specifically say that you should restrict the height to 25 points so also add dot frame with a height of 25. Looking good. Look at that Grogu peeking. Now in order to play sounds, we need to import AVF audio up top, and we also need to create a state variable that's an audio player. So we'll say at state private var audio player colon AV audio player with an exclamation point. So we define this as an implicitly unwrapped optional, but we don't initialize it. Very important to make sure you got that exclamation point after AV audio player. And to make sure that the same sound is not repeated more than twice in a row, we'll add a state variable at state private var, and we'll call this last sound. And we'll initially set this equal to negative one. That's a sound that does not exist, and that'll ensure that the first random sound that we come up with will be played. Then for our button action, we're going to say var next sound colon int. So we'll declare a variable called next sound, but we won't initialize it. And then we'll use a repeat while statement. So we'll say repeat open and close curly. We'll set next sound equal to int dot random in zero triple dot eight. That's because we have sounds from zero to eight. And after the close curly, we'll say while next sound double equals last sound. So this is going to continue to repeat generating new random sounds until we've generated a new random sound called next sound that is different from the last sound. Now down below this, we're going to want to play sound, but we haven't written our play sound function. And again, our students did all of this in their very first app. You are awesome. So everybody should know how to do this before the closing curly. We'll add our function 
play sound between parens we'll pass in a variable called sound name colon which is of type string open and close curlies and then inside we'll first make sure that we can read the data from a file with the name sound name from our asset catalog so we'll say guard let sound file equals ns data asset selecting the option with name passing in a string that's going to be sound name else open and close curlies and if this doesn't work we'll say print Passing in angry emoji, error colon could not read file named string interp sound name. Then always make sure that your guardlet has a return in between the curlies. But if that works, let's get the data inside that file and play it. So we need to do that inside of a do catch clause because this could throw an error. So we'll say do open and close curlies, catch open and close curlies. I'll copy and paste my error statement up here, paste it in between the catch, and I'll change this so it prints out error string interp error dot localized description creating audio player. Then down here, we're going to say audio player equals try AV audio player, selecting the option with data. And remember, this throws an error. So that's why we're in do try catch. And we've got a try out front here. And the data that we're going to pass in is going to be sound file dot data. Now, if this doesn't work, we'll throw an error and it'll be caught in the catch. But if it does work, we just want to say audio player dot play open and close parens. And it's not going to work because we haven't yet called our play sound function in our button action. So let's do that. So after the repeat while, we'll say last sound equals next sound. So we make sure that we pay attention to the last sound that were played. And let's play that last sound. So we'll say play sound. And the sound name we'll pass in will be in between quotes. We'll add string interp and pass in last sound. Now let's click Yoda and give that a shot. Do or do not. There is no try. Why do you ask me? The answer you already know. Uncertain the answer is. Later, you may ask again. Hmm, I believe the answer is yes. Oh, nice work! That's a delightful addition, in addition to being able to browse and check out the species. Now to finish this off, let's change the asset color, and we do that inside of the asset catalog. So open up the project navigator, click on asset catalog, and we see X and color up top, so click that. Then we'll click the box that says universal. Open up the identity inspector down here under color, click on the content option, select system green. This is now the accent color that will be used as a default color for our button. So let's click on our species list view and try this out. And ho oh, ho, we see load all showing up in green. If we click on any of these guys, we also see the back button to species also shows up in green as well. As mentioned, if your Xcode wasn't showing this, it was a little buggy. All you need to do is build and run the simulator and then come back and the green should be showing up fine. But Swifter, I hope this exam worked out well for you. And if you struggled at anything, I hope reviewing the exam here was very helpful. If you're one of our friends that's following along via YouTube, I hope you found this interesting as well. If so, make sure you leave a comment down and like the vid. Remember, our entire class, including all the learning videos, is on online on the YouTube channel bit.ly slash prof g swift ui. I hope you come back for more swifty goodness. Continue to have.